Okay. So we just finished up with uh, this brief introduction to fluid dynamics, and we are going to now begin to apply those principles directly to the heart itself. So we need to basically begin here with the heart chamber and the pressures that are experienced in the heart chambers. How much pressure is actually going to be induced? How is the pressure going to be induced? What are the consequences on blood flow? So we're just going to start with just an example of one of the chambers. I'm just going to choose a ventricle. And as that ventricle relaxes, so the signal to contract has ceased. We're in that absolute refractory period. The muscle contracts, and now it's going through its relaxation. During ventricular or atrial relaxation, we have an increase in the chamber's volume. So the increase in the chamber's volume, and this relates to the fact that as muscle relaxes, the chamber opens back up or gets larger. This increase in chamber volume, what is going to be the result on pressure? So pressure will decrease, and that's because of that inverse relationship between container volume and container pressure. So volume increases, pressure decreases. All right, we get another signal to cause the ventricle to contract. As the ventricle contracts, what's happening to chamber volume? Okay, so we have a drop in chamber volume. And with that drop in chamber volume, what's going to happen to chamber pressure? Okay, so we'll have an increase in the pressure. Okay, you can apply the same to the atria as well. The ventricles are just going to do it a lot more because they're so much larger and they have a thicker uh, muscle. So let's really get into a specific example here. And we'll use our biggest ventricle, the left ventricle, thickest muscle. Okay, so with this really thick muscle, we start out with blood pressure being elevated in the pulmonary vein. So we have elevated pressure in the pulmonary vein. Now that elevated pressure in the pulmonary vein, that's going to interact with the atria, right? So the pulmonary vein, higher pressure here, lower pressure in the atria, fluids always flow from high pressure to low pressure, so this is going to cause the atria the left atria to begin to fill. So we have atrium that fill, the atria fill, and as the atria fills, remember what do we have between, let me try to draw left side of the heart here. So we have the atria here, we have the ventricle here. Right there, this is where blood is coming in from. Right here we have the AV valve. It's higher pressure here, lower pressure in here, but as blood fills in, what's happening to pressure in the chamber? It's actually going up. And we're going to get to a point where we're actually very close to being equalized between where the blood is coming in and where the blood is in the atrium. What do I have right here between the atrium and the ventricle? AV valve, okay? 
so that AV valve is now beginning to experience increasing amounts of pressure as more and more blood flows into the atria. Eventually, that atrial pressure is going to be stronger than the pressure in the ventricle that's holding the uh, AV valve shut. So eventually we're going to have so much pressure here in the, in the atrium that the pressure is going to be lower here, higher here, and the, the, the valve is actually going to open up and blood is going to begin to make its way into the ventricle. Right? Because I got a pressure out here in the pulmonary vein, I have a pressure inside here of the atria, and I have a pressure here in the ventricle. And each of these pressures is going to be different. Highest pressure starts out here in the pulmonary vein, but the pressure increases here in the atria as blood flows in, reducing that volume of the chamber because blood's taking up space. Eventually, we're going to meet and exceed the pressure that we find in the ventricle, and that'll cause the AV valve to open up. So once the AV valve opens, we're going to have initial flow of that higher pressure blood in the atrium into the lower pressure ventricle. Now, this is going to happen with no muscle contraction. We're filling up the atria, creating a higher and higher pressure. Eventually, AV valve opens once the pressure in the atria exceeds the pressure in the ventricle, and it just pours in. There is no muscle contraction at this point. That's why we call it passive filling. Now, during this blood flow into the ventricle, we get enough blood flowing into the ventricle that the AV valve leaflets or cusps begin to float on that filling blood. Okay, so we have enough blood that's moved into the ventricle and those cusps begin to sort of float up on top of the blood as it fills up. Now the atria are actually going to be stimulated to contract. They're going to push in a little bit more blood, which would be active filling. Shortly after the atria contract, the ventricles are going to be stimulated to contract. Remember we have that pause in the AV valve to allow the atria to contract, and then the ventricles follow. So once the ventricles contract, after we've loaded as much blood into the left ventricle from the atria that we're going to, the ventricle is going to receive that signal and it's going to be stimulated to contract on its own. Okay, so the ventricle is stimulated to contract. Now, once the ventricle begins to contract, what is happening to the chamber size or the chamber volume in the left ventricle? So we're going to have a decrease in chamber size, a decrease in chamber volume. Now what's happening to the blood at this time? Increasing, decreasing, staying the same. The amount of blood. Right at the beginning of ventricular contraction. There's very little change in the amount of blood, the amount of the fluid in the ventricle. The ventricle, the volume of the ventricle is changing, but the amount of blood that's present that we can measure as a volume is not changing. It's remaining the same. We've loaded it up from the atria, and so now we're just squeezing on that. That would be like me taking one of your water bottles, not dumping any water out. I squeeze on it. The volume of the liquid in the bottle doesn't change, but when I squeeze on it, I'm reducing the volume of the container. So we have this decrease in chamber size and a result in an increase in 
the pressure on the blood, or what I'm going to just refer to as the blood's pressure. So really, I guess it might even be better to call it the, the chamber's pressure, and that chamber's pressure is acting on the fluid of the blood as the ventricle contracts. As this happens, though, as the pressure in the chamber increases in response to the decrease in volume as it contracts, the pressure in the chamber also not only interacts with the blood, but it's interacting with the AV valve as well. So the AV valve is starting to float up, pressure begins to change, and so it's actually going to push up on the AV valve or push the AV valve back into its original position to close. Now the contracting of the muscle also contracts papillary muscles connected to chordae tendineae, connected to the cusp of the AV valve to prevent prolapse. So you basically have in one direction the, the cusp being pulled on, in the other direction being pushed by the pressure, and they close perfectly to allow no leakage of blood back into the atria. In addition to the blood and the AV valve, we're also going to have pressure imputed on the semilunar valve. Okay, so pressure begins to uh, push back on the semilunar valve. This particular semilunar valve, by the way, what is it? We're in the aortic. I'm sorry. No, never mind. It's the aortic semilunar valve. We're in the left ventricle. <laughs> so that semilunar valve uh, is getting pressure, receiving pressure from the contracting chamber, and this causes the cusps to open. Now, what would be required for the cusps to open? We would need a high enough pressure in the left ventricle to overcome the pressure out in the aorta. Now what's happening during this whole time is we actually have pressure dropping in the aorta because blood is circulating out into other portions of the general circulation. And so as the blood leaves the aorta, we actually aren't really changing the, um, we're, we're changing the, the volume of blood, and the aorta is actually changing, it's responding and recoiling, pressing down on that blood as well. And so we have a drop in pressure in the aorta as blood leaves. And the blood that is in the ventricle. Once the ventricle's pressure exceeds the aorta pressure, we'll push out into the aorta and then into our systemic circuit or our general circuit. Oops, not, not a G there. So it's just two names for the general circuit, systemic circuit or general circuit. Okay, so hopefully you're able to keep track of the blood volume, the chamber volume, the chamber pressure, and what the chamber pressure is doing to the blood, to the valves, to ventricle walls, vessel walls, and whatnot. Because now we're going to take all of this and we're going to stream everything together. So basically, we're working to a point where we can start talking about this thing called the cardiac cycle, the human model for what's going on inside of the heart. And we're going to start out with the stages of the cardiac uh, cycle. What you're looking at here, and this is there's a ton of stuff going on on this video, but you have the different uh, named portions of the cardiac cycle, diastole and systole. You have the pressures at a variety of different locations inside of the heart. You have the volumes 
inside of the ventricle. You have the electrical activity as an ECG. You have the heart sounds, the lubs and the dubs. And you have the phases, the different phases of the cardiac cycle. So this is one beat of the heart. All of this is recorded in a single beat. Okay, so these are going to be the stages of the cardiac cycle. Um, it's a cycle, so it doesn't really have a beginning, but by convention, we typically start and label stage number one as ventricular filling. So ventricular filling. And if you look down here at the bottom, if you can read that, you'll have you'll see that stage one is actually divided into two substages. One A, which is rapid filling, and one B, which is diastasis. So stage number one, we're going to have this portion of the cardiac cycle called rapid filling. And just like its name suggests, we're going to have rapid flow of blood into the ventricle. So the pressures, oh, that's supposed to be a D, rapid filling. The pressures are going to be higher in the atria and lower in the ventricle. Higher in the atria, lower in the ventricle. You have a figure very similar to this in your book, and you're going to want to spend some time with this figure as you're learning this as you're learning this uh, this material. So in uh, this is a purple color right on the edge, which relates to uh, this purple color right here. So you're basically getting two individual cycles through um, through the heart, and, and actually this last portion here is a little bit cut off. So we're going to deal basically with this portion of the figure, okay? So during rapid filling, what we are going to see, if you go through and look at all of the pressures, you can look at ventricular pressure. Left ventricular pressure is here in black, and you can see that it's actually lower than the left atrial pressure. There's a difference there. It's a small difference, but it is still enough of a difference that blood will rush into the left ventricle. As that happens, this is your ventricular pressure, I'm sorry, ventricular volume. You can see that we have sort of this increase. The curve here, if I were to lay a line on there, on that portion of the curve, and lay a line on the portion of the curve over here in the lighter blue color, you can see that the slopes are different. The slope is related to the rate, and so the rate of filling is much quicker here than it is here. This is a slower rate. So we have rapid filling, and then we have that diastasis, which is also sometimes referred to as slow filling. The rapid filling is because the blood is has a higher pressure, a higher force from the atria pushing it into the ventricle. Okay, so diastasis, this is also uh, referred to as slow filling to take it juxtaposed to the rapid filling. And what's happening here is the pressures have begun to equalize, right? So as blood flows into a new area, the volume is consumed by that blood, and so volume is going to decrease, resulting in a decrease in pressure, or there's a equalization of pressure between the two. So for that slow filling, the pressure is near equal between the ventricle and the atria. Now notice your heart sounds here. Okay? You have two different heart sounds that are occurring. And those heart sounds, right before we go into that slow filling stage, we have a small heart sound that 
small heart sound is due to the smaller contraction of the atria. So the atria is going to contract and it's going to squirt in the last remaining amount of blood and then we're going to move into um, the ventricles contracting. So on our graph here, we fill it up and then we have our heart sound. Shortly after the heart sound, we have that spurt of blood there the, the, uh, as the um, atrial systole or atrial contraction occurs to squeeze out just a little bit more blood. We have this short increase in, uh, in pressure, a, a small increase in pressure as the atria contracts. Okay, and that's following shortly after the, the uh, atrial heart sound. So that's going to be called atrial systole. So during atrial systole, atria contract. We should also expect to see during atrial contraction or near atrial contraction electrical activity that suggests that the atria are contracting. That's going to be our P wave on the, Q, on the ECG. We see the change in volume. We also see this increase in pressure. Now, what you can't see underneath this red line or underneath the black line, whatever you're seeing there, the, the pressures between the left ventricle and the atria or the right ventricle and the, and the right atria are near the same. There is a small little difference there that you can't really see, but again, it's enough of a pressure difference that it favors blood movement into the ventricle. So during atrial systole, with that atria contraction or atrial contraction, we have another change in pressure. We're going to have this jump in the atrial pressure and a smaller jump in the ventricular pressure. And that's going to be just related to the blood squirting into the ventricle. Ventricular chamber volume is not really changing. We're shoving more blood in there, which means pressure is going to go up just a little bit more. But it goes up more in the atria because that's where the heart is actually contracting to squeeze in just a little bit more blood. Now, after our passive, our, our rapid filling and our um, slow filling, both of them are passive. We have our atria contract. This becomes active filling, and it spurts just a remaining volume of blood. And we end up right before everything called, or the, this region of the graph called systole, we end up with a, a known volume of blood right at that point. And that's called the end diastolic volume. Okay, our end diastolic volume, which is frequently abbreviated the EDV, and the end diastolic volume on average in adult humans is about 130 milliliters of blood. And that's going to be specific to the left ventricle. The right ventricle would also have an end diastolic volume, and it's going to be a little bit different, but that's going to be the blood that gets pushed out into the pulmonary circuit, the left ventricle, which is really going to be the one that becomes medically most important as we're dealing with permeating and perfusing uh, blood and nutrients and oxygen to the organs and the heart and the, the brain. If we see a drop in end diastolic volume from 130 milliliters down to, let's say, 70 milliliters, it becomes medically emergent. Okay? So this is the more important variable, so to speak, at the end of diastole, after we filled the ventricle, the left ventricle, with its maximum amount of blood, the end diastolic volume. Everybody got this? Okay, so that would end stage one here, which is our ventricular filling, and we'll move into stage number two. Stage number two is going to be deemed isovolumetric 
contraction. Isovolumetric contraction. So let's first deal with the pressure right at the beginning of this stage of the cardiac cycle. The atria have just contracted and dumped all their blood into, of, into the ventricles. So the atria are actually going to be lower pressure here. The ventricles are now going to be higher pressure. So if we have lower pressure and we have higher pressure, lower in the atria, higher in the ventricle, the blood and everything is pushing back towards the atria. That means that things like the AV valve is going to snap shut. Now this is going to be a contraction stage, but it's isovolumetric contraction. Iso means that there is no change in volume. So contraction is going to occur, but we're not going to have a change in volume. In other words, we're not going to see any blood ejected. So no blood is ejected yet. The reason that this is, is we have to open up the pulmonary or the aortic semilunar valve. During isovolumetric contraction, the heart is contracting and is pushing down on that blood, but we haven't reached a point yet where we've overcome the, uh, the pressure on the other side of the semilunar valve. You can hear the AV valve check? Yeah, we're going to hear the AV valve shut. And really, in all reality, that's what these heart sounds are all about. So you like the love dub, what is that? What is that? The love dub, the love is the AV valve shutting, the dub is going to be the pulmonary valve and the aortic semilunar valve shutting. Okay, so the pressure is higher in the pulmonary artery or in the aorta. And so this results in closed semilunar valves. So even though we're increasing the pressure, and you can see that pressure here, Inside of the ventricle, this black line, if we track this black line, this is increasing. But notice, all the way through here, the pressure is lower than the aortic pressure. And as long as the pressure is lower than the aortic pressure, we wouldn't open up that semilunar valve. And so we're going to have this, the volume is remaining the same right here. Once we get to this point here where we jump over that red line, because this is the aortic pressure, which uh, is occurring right here, all the way along here, you're going to see that we have some pressure changes that occur, and then volume is going to begin to decrease. Okay. Is everybody able to differentiate the colors here? I don't know if you can see it or not. There is a very small band right here that I'm running my finger over. That's a kind of a lighter yellow color, and then this darker yellow color or tannish color is this area of systole right here. Okay? So we're talking about what's happening right along here until we get to this point right here where the uh, ventricular pressure is going to jump over the aortic pressure. Okay, so now we get to a point where the aortic pressure is exceeded and we move into move, uh, ventricular ejection, moving blood from the ventricle into the valve or into the vessel. 
Okay, so the ventricle begins to eject blood. We call this ventricular ejection stage number three. So once the ventricles have contracted enough, and, and it's not really taking, this is, the, you know, you can see the time down here in seconds, and it's not taking very long. It's basically taking about a quarter of a second to do this, to get to a point where the ventricular pressure has exceeded the arterial pressure, the pressure out in the aorta and in the general circuit. And as you probably are already able to guess, once that happens, we now are no longer able to hold the semilunar valve shut. And so the semilunar valve opens up and it opens into the aorta. We have now induced a very high amount of pressure. We've gone from a pretty low pressure, really near about zero, to now a pressure that's exce exceeding 80 millimeters of mercury. Okay? So what would be analogous here? If I were to take someone's water bottle, can I borrow your water bottle here? So if I were to take the water bottle, got the tight, the top on there really secure, I squeeze it. This is going to be my isovolumetric contraction. I'm squeezing on the bottle, but there's no there's no release of fluid, right? And then I were to open it up, and what would happen? Initially, it would shoot out enough, and I'd probably hit poor Kristen in the face. But eventually, it would just sort of be really low flow, but it would still be pouring out, right? So the heart, you're building up this pressure, and you're getting this super high pressure inside of the heart, so that once that valve opens up, you got all this pressure behind there, and so it just fires out. And so we should see an initial decrease in volume that is very, very rapid that eventually slows down. So again, if I sort of do the same curve fitting analysis here, if I put a curve on the initial part, it's almost vertical, indicating that in a unit of time, the amount of blood volume lost is high, so very high rate. But eventually it slows down. And that slope of that line decreases, indicating the rate of flow is decreasing as well. So the semilunar valve opens up, and the initial ejection of blood is rapid. So we have this initial ejection of blood that is very, very rapid. Now, as that blood rapidly pours out, pressure is going to begin to drop. So the, vet or the, uh, the chamber, as blood leaves, as blood is being squirted out, the volume of the chamber increases because you're losing the matter that's taking up space. You're losing the blood, the fluid that's taking up space. So pressure begins to drop, and so we're going to have a later stage where ejection is slower. So we start out very rapid, and then we get towards the end here where the rate decreases and is much slower. If it was the same amount of rate, what we would see is rather than having a curved shape here, this line would be more, more linear, more straight, indicating that there's the same unit of um, volume loss in a given unit of time. But we're changing our rate, so it's more of a curve, a curve, more of a curve or parabolic shape. Now, as perfect as everybody is in here, there are parts of your physiology that are not. This idea of ejection is one of those cases where it is not perfect. Anyone remember what our end diastolic volume was? Okay, 130 in the left ventricle. 
So if ejection was perfect, what should we expect our end systolic volume to be? We would expect it to be equal at 130 milliliters. In all reality, it is not. And in fact, we only really usually deliver between 60 and 70 milliliters of blood in what's known as the stroke volume. So a good normal stroke volume, which is the amount of blood that leaves the left ventricle, is right around 70 milliliters. So 130 milliliters minus 70 milliliters equals 60 milliliters. So we should expect that we're going to retain about 60 milliliters of that blood after each stroke of the heart. And that's actually what you see here. You can see that the graph doesn't go down to zero for volume. It actually goes down to 60. And so we end up with a end systolic volume that's right around 60 milliliters of blood. Now these are very important numbers from a clinical perspective. So the stroke volume again, just to make sure that you know what this is, understand what this is, this is going to be the blood that's ejected during the ventricular contraction or ventricular ejection. Okay, so that's the blood that we get rid of. Now, if you do the math and you take your 70 milliliters and divide it by the 130 milliliters of blood, so take your stroke volume and divide it by your end diastolic volume, the result, the results, that's probably supposed to be the results are, the results is, the results are 54% of the 130 milliliters would be ejected. Okay, so 54%. Another way to put that percentage is to recognize that it's also a fraction, right? A mathematical fraction. And so we refer to that 54% of blood ejected from the left ventricle. We call that the ejection fraction. This is the fraction or part of the blood that is ejected from the left ventricle. Now we still have 46% of the blood remaining inside of the ventricle. That's 60 milliliters left over, and it's in the ventricle. And this volume is going to be our end systolic volume. So this is going to be our end systolic volume. We call that our ESV. Uh -huh. So our end systolic volume. Uh, of all of these numbers, what do you think is probably clinically the most important? What's that? What did you say? Okay, what did you say? Okay, why would you say those? Well, but systole and diastole are just simply references to the relaxation of the ventricle, pressures in, in during rapid relaxation of the ventricle is diastolic, pressures during ventricular contraction are systolic. What's really important is what we're getting rid of, what we're circulating to our vital organs. So ejection fraction is going to be a very important clinical
very important clinical number for people who are undergoing any sort of cardiovascular distress. So ejection fraction, we actually can measure with things like echocardiogram. We can actually even estimate it based off of other parameters. Um, so really, the stroke volume, how much blood is being delivered, is going to be important. And it actually changes. It can decrease during pathophysiological circumstances. But even under normal circumstances, it can change as well. It's actually going to increase with exercise. So as exercise uh, intensity increases, we have an increase in the amount of blood that is delivered to the general circuit. And it can decrease with certain diseases. So it becomes one of the more important clinical indicators for the function of the heart. Okay, we've got one more uh, stage that we need to talk about here before we can move on. call that stage four, and this is going to be isovolumetric relaxation. So isovolumetric relaxation. So it, this is that purple color. It's probably sort of hard to see. You got it represented here. You can also see a little bit of it here. But they're an isovolumetric relaxation, you can see that the volume, again, volume of, uh, of the blood does not change. So our end systolic volume is uh, preserved during isovolumetric relaxation. Electrical activity of the heart is basically just about done. You can hear um, valves shutting, and that's one of our heart sounds there. Uh, also notice that you have some interesting things going on here with pressure. Obviously, ventricular pressure is, is decreasing. This is going to be our left atrial pressure, and we actually have this little kind of hump or increase as the left atria uh, begin to uh, undergo their, um, as we're leading into the next portion of the curve here. So we have a little bit of increase in pressure. And then we also have this little... Uh, what's called the dichrotic arch. It's this little tiny kind of dip in aortic pressure. It, it decreases and then it increases and then begins to decrease. Okay. Now, exactly why isovolumetric relaxation or how it occurs, there's actually going to be two hypotheses. So the heart, the ventricle, the tissue around the ventricle is all contracted. And so now we need to actually increase it back out in size. And this is going to occur during isovolumetric relaxation. One of the hypotheses is going to be that the ventricle inflates by inflowing blood. So as the heart relaxes, we don't have a change in volume. We're not seeing this change in volume. There's an increase in blood, but the change in volume may be happening in a one-to-one -one ratio where as the blood fills, the, the volume is not changing. So it would kind of be like me taking a water bottle again. That we're good. And I squeeze down on it. And you can see that the level here, if I release it, it, it goes below the, the label. If I squeeze on it, it increases up, right? That's going to be a certain volume. So as the, the 
uh, ventricle rec recoils, it would be like filling up enough blood so that it maintains it at that level. Does that make sense? So as blood pours in there, it causes it to relax into, into rebound, but it's happening so that the blood that's coming in doesn't change. It's happening at the same rate to keep it at the same level. Does that make sense? Okay, so that would be one of our theories. Our second, or one of our hypotheses, our second hypothesis is actually going to be that when the heart contracted, it deformed that thing called the heart skeleton. So the heart skeleton gets deformed, and now it's beginning to bounce back and recoil back to its original position. After the ventricle has contracted. Now, in all reality, it may actually be both a combination of both hypotheses, or it may be one or the other, or it may not be either. So, number two, this is the second hypothesis the deformed heart skeleton, the deformed heart skeleton bounces back after ventricular contraction. All right. That's all the time we have for today. Do we have any clarification here? Everybody got it? Why is, why is, like, is everything else that we've studied for as long as the heart is concerned so far for, like, the stages? It's like, clear cut, and it's like, they know. But then, like, why is this? Oh, well, it could be this way, this way. Like, what, what's inhibiting the study of it or? Technology. technology. Yeah, I mean, how do you to, to look at deformation and things like that? We have to put strain gauges in or something like that. We probably could, but we'd have to do it in a model organism, um, ethically. So, I mean, we're thinking probably chimpanzee or a king. Well, both of those are really expensive model organisms. In fact, a monkey, a chimpanzee. I mean, right out of the gate, you're spending a hundred thousand dollars to get the animal, and then you have to think about a life insurance policy and a health policy. And you have to, if, if, if you're not going to sacrifice the animal, if there's no ethical reason to sacrifice the animal to the study, then in addition to all the money you've already spent, you have to pay for the, the rest of its existence. Food, housing, everything. So expensive. Um, based off of the data that's available, it looks like it's one of these two things in common. It's probably really a combination of the two. Okay. So if someone found a clot, a blood clot, would they have to 